welcome to the stage, Tess. Hello, everyone. I haven't actually had a lesson on this. Forward. Fantastic. I'd like to just first tell you a little bit about Secret Emporium and why we started it, just to set the scene. We were currently, Lucy and I, my original uh, business partner, were working in uh, the festival industry and events in general. And there seemed to be a huge gap in the market for retail at festivals. A lot of stuff was imported from India and it didn't seem to celebrate independent makers and designers at all. So we decided to attempt to bring a higher quality of retail to these environments. And the first thing we did is we got a small marquee and we filled it predominantly at the beginning with a lot of our friends, people who made things, people who enjoyed making things. It was just an experiment just to see whether it would work. And it did. People really, really, really enjoyed the sort of things, the original items, and the sort of things that celebrated that costume culture of festivals, so the eccentric. And uh, it worked fantastically well, and we've grown from there. Uh, so that is <laughs> an indication of the sort of thing. That's what it looks like when you put a lot of creative people under one roof. Um, we support the designers by providing them with the infrastructure. We bring the tent, we sort the electricity, we sort the press, we sort the PR. All they have to do is come with a wheelie suitcase with their product. So it takes a lot of the pressure off people who haven't been in the business for too long and don't know what they're doing and how to present themselves. All they have to do is come along and learn. We also have an SE Present stand where we will actually take products from designers who aren't there and sell them for them as well and produce our own, our own range. So you can, you can see the mud, but uh, I'm sure you will know that the festival culture in this country has really evolved. It's really changed. It's no longer the days of Glastonbury where you just had a, you know, a hat and an anorak. Actually, festival fashion is in itself something that magazines and other people in the industry actually reference. So it's something that's actually becoming its own style. There's things like Coachella, for example, a huge festival over in America, and actually the fashion is far more reported than, than anything else. Obviously, the purpose is to have a lot of fun. I think what can happen with industry sometimes is that you have to sometimes take the fun out of your product in order to make it sellable. And what we always try to... Uh, uh, encourage in our secret emporium designers is to retain that creativity that they had perhaps um, when they were graduate and to keep that going and know that there is a place for the eccentric and there is a place for that kind of creativity in a product. We also have an online shop where we sell the products. Um, often they are fa uh, this festival orientated but also um, they are coming more into the mainstream as well. It just depends which designers we've got there on the, at the time. We do immersive markets, mainly in London, definitely a Christmas market, which works really well, and uh, pop-up shops in places like Box Park. Uh, we, essentially, every event that we do, we curate a list of designers for that event, a sort of collection, a curation, and that's really important to us that we're actually matching those designers together. So, I want to talk a little bit about the person that inspired our first scholarship and why I believe that there's such an importance put on patronage and being able to encourage young designers. So this is our, uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> that's the next slide. <laughs> this is um, two of our, uh, of our scholars and recently we often go to all the um, college fashion shows and talent scout and spot from the runway shows, from their stands, then approach them. Often they don't have a product line. All they have is what they produce for the runway. And then we give them an opportunity to look at how that would become a product line. So EA Burns, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I found Lizzie at a jumble sale pop-up shop in East London. I thought she was amazing. She was um, working with triangles, which we all know now is the biggest trend ever. But at the time, it kind of wasn't. She was also uh, um, an assistant for Mrs. Jones, uh, Kylie's stylist, famous white jumpsuit. And she was doing a very simple thing with these triangles, with these geometric shapes. 
and I asked her, would she take a pitch at one of our events? And she laughed at me and she said, I can't even pay my rent. How is that possibly going to happen? And maybe it's the maternal instinct in me, um, I don't know, but I felt that this was completely wrong. She should be there, and if she could make some money while she was there, she can continue her label. And that was a really important thing to me. So the scholarship scheme was born. Every event we do, including this one, we have two scholars. Those scholars do not pay anything. They are here for free, and it's something that's hugely important and underpins the whole concept of the business. Um, this was Lizzie's first stool, as you can see, quite rudimentary, um, a lot of triangles. When she did that event that was a festival, she came away with in excess of £2,000. Now, £2,000 cash to someone who cannot pay, pay their rent is a huge amount of money, and it allowed her to continue for a couple of months, and I began to see that importance. Lizzie uh, has honed her trade and her craft so much over these last couple of years. This was the sort of thing that she began to do. You can see there's a sharpness to it. She's exploring 3D elements and definitely going towards more showpiece jewelry. I wanted to show this, this sort of journey that she's been on and these are her most recent collection. They still have the geometric form and they still have the creativity but there's a maturity to her line now, and it's really amazing to see that journey that she's been on. Right, <laughs> this is another example of the scholarship program. Uh, SJ, Sarah Jane, was uh, doing some styling for one of our shoots, and we had all the products laid out, and she absolutely loved everything, and she said, I've always wanted to be a designer. I don't really know why I'm a stylist. It's what I've always wanted to do. And we saw that there was a real gap in the market for, especially at festivals, for someone doing something exciting with eyewear, with sunglasses. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we asked her, you, you can have a scholarship pitch, do something interesting, just treat it as an experiment. Here she is with a Power Ranger on her head. She spent the entire festival gluing small bits of jewels to sunglasses. You can see there's only one on her table because every single time she made one and put it in front of her, it would sell. She couldn't make them quick enough. This started something in her mind. She moved on to dinosaurs. They're hugely, hugely popular. In fact, some of you may have already seen them. She really embraced the festival idea of people want to have fun, they want to play, and... <laughs> It's a lot of fun. <laughs> her range uh, it, uh, increased, and through our PR agents, she got a huge deal um, with a supplier in China, and her label completely took off. She is not able to keep up with her orders. It's that classic, it, growing so fast, so quick. And of course, now she's honing her business, honing her situation. What really changed everything, she came to Wilderness Festival with us. Cara Delevingne visited. As we all know, anything Cara Delevingne picks up, it's a good thing. She spent the entire summer wearing a pair of uh, SJ's glasses, um, and it was all tied in with a, little, a lot of press from Mulberry, so it was really wide, widely seen. And as you can imagine, that's the sort of thing that makes someone's, makes someone's career, makes someone's label really successful. I just want to talk very briefly. I'm not sure quite how much time I've got left. OK. So to your right <laughs> is our, um, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, is our uh, collection for Pulse. After the talk, if you can, please go and have a look. There's some incredible designers in there, lots of people that have been with us for quite some time, uh, including uh, people like Wolf and Moon and Tessa Metcalf, the likes of which I'm modeling for you. Go and have a look. They're incredible, incredible, incredible designers. They love what they do. They're fully independent. It's them. It's them making everything in this country. And they're making this step up to this kind of environment where they can wholesale. So it's a really exciting time for a lot of them. The two scholars for Pulse are Mona and Dazzle and Jolt. Here's Mona, needless to say, swimwear. <laughs> She's just in there on the right-hand side. Um, she's a really new, fresh designer. 
um, a lovely, beautiful Irish girl, and the things that she's producing and the modeling, the model shots that she's producing are of such a high quality. And all she needs now is that environment and that infrastructure to step things up a little bit, but of a really, really high quality already. Dazzle and Jolt is a lot of fun, a huge, huge, huge amount of fun. And she's a classic for us, a classic Secret Emporium designer, because despite coming out of university and coming into reality, at no point, at no point has she calmed down what she's doing. She's saying this is her. She turned up yesterday, she's been at a, another show, in her own outfit from top to toe, with matching dyed hair. Incredible. She lives and breathes her brand. When you go to a stand, you meet that person that made that with their hands. You don't meet someone who's just selling it for someone else. So this is our collection for, for Pulse. Please do go and have a look. And just to end on the importance of patronage, obviously for me, it is the essence of what we do. And I think that often what you will do as buyers is you talent scout. You go and you see something and you've got two things in your brain. Will it sell? And is it innovative? And is it new? And often, I think, I'm not sure, if things aren't packaged properly, if they're not at the right limit, if they don't quite have enough numbers, if it's not quite, quite going to hit your targets, it's very easy to say, I like it, but I can't risk it. And I would urge you to risk it. Because if you start a relationship with that designer early on, even if there are some teething problems in the beginning, they're the sort of people, because they're the independents, that will be loyal to you. And your advice back to them is a really important thing. And I know it's quite a maternal role, but I actually think that people like yourselves in this industry who've been doing it for years, I do actually think it's, it's also, in some ways, your duty. Because you know what you're talking about and you know what's going to sell. So if you do, after the talk, if you are able to go next door, have a look around and give any advice you can. They're just as hungry for advice as they are for orders. Hopefully, you'll find that they are ready to go and they're fantastic. But I would definitely urge you, if possible, to um, maybe pick two people this year that you really see something special in and you know they've got it. They might not quite be there, but you know they've got it. And just have those two people, take them under your wing, and I think the rewards will be incredibly beneficial because we've definitely found that to be the case. Thank you.